Hey everybody, how you doing? Hope all's well. Uh, happy Thursday afternoon for March 7th. Crazy to think uh, that we're in March already. Um, with that being said, time just keeps flying by, right? Um, welcome to you know this uh, Flag Star Flex series for March. We're really excited uh, about our guest speaker and what we're the topic we're going to be covering today. Let's start as always, right? Thanks for uh, joining us today. Hope you, family, everybody doing uh, well, healthy, safe, uh, enjoying as we start to get into the springtime, right? Uh, coming out of yeah, Q4 and, and the beginnings of Q1 as we start to get closer to that traditional buying season. Um, so hopefully you're doing well. And again, thanks for joining us for uh, this month's segment. Uh, and I'm going to introduce, I'll give you a, a little bit of a background on our guest speaker. I'm really excited about having him on today. Um, I got introduced to him through a, another uh, one of our AEs got uh, introduced me to, to this individual. I've had a chance to talk to him a couple of times and, and man, am I really excited for today's session. So he is a Hall of Fame originator, entrepreneur, public speaker, business and life coach. And he's also the host of the podcast uh, called 360 Experience. He's currently the chief content officer at the Loan Atlas, a learning platform and community for loan professionals. Amongst his must-haves for business successes are knowing the ins and outs of the numbers. I always think that's key to anything you do in, in, in business, having the right business planning tools, and taking strong, specific steps to capture leads. And he's going to talk a lot about that today. Uh, during his 25-plus years of a diverse background in the mortgage industry, he has successfully founded, scaled, and sold two uh, game-changing companies, First Rate Financial and the TheLoanToolbox.com. And obviously, he's received numerous accolades along the way uh, and praise for his work as one of the top mortgage coaches uh, out there in the space. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome Tim Brahim. Wow. Thank you so much, John, for the kind introduction. And um, I want to say thank you to everybody that's tuned in for this. Um, this promises to be a, hopefully a very valuable next 60 to 75 minutes Um it's my pleasure to be here. It's always a little bit strange for me being in a, a little studio right now, and I can't really see all of you, um, and you can see me, so it's kind of a, a, a bit of a naked experience in that regard. Um, but welcome to all of you, and I'm really thrilled to be here, and I'm really looking forward to helping you over the course of the next hour or so and teaching you some things that I think are really valuable and important in today's market. Yeah, Tim, I can't thank you enough for doing it. And, and look, the content, I, I know we've had a chance to talk about it, just it's so timely, right? In regards to, I think what, you know, look, we faced a lot of challenges in this industry, right? We always do uh, good times or bad. And at the end of the day, I think a lot of times, you know, taking a pause, taking a deep dive, taking a look at, you know, kind of business model, the, your, your database, your past clients, it's so key. And I think it goes, in some cases, it goes unmanaged and un, unreviewed and untaken advantage of, quite honestly. So I was really excited for today. And yeah, let's get into it, man. Sounds great. So let me lay out the, the game plan here for everybody, okay? We're going to spend about the next 40 minutes with me teaching you some very important concepts about what you need to be doing right now in your business. This is going to include me going through this spreadsheet that I've created for you, which is a business planning tool. And that tool is going to be made available to you after this call to download for free. And I'll tell you at the end of the call what URL to go to and all of that. After we're done with that, at about 45 minutes after the hour, I'm going to share with you a platform that I think you should all be considering becoming a part of that is going to be, you know, something that's going to be hugely impactful in your business. And then um, I'm going to hang out. So if we go past the top of the hour, and I can serve you, I can coach you. Um, please have your questions at the ready. I'm gonna hang out until about uh, 15 minutes past the top of the hour and just coach you in, in, in any way that I can to, to try to help you. Okay. Yeah, hey Tim, hey Tim, real quick, not to interrupt your flow, but I did forget to say that in the beginning. If you have any questions along the way, you don't have to wait until the end too, right? We'll, we'll cover them throughout the content if it fits in or we'll get them towards the end. But yeah, by all means, submit any questions below. Great. So. The first thing, maybe we can take the spreadsheet off and just have me on camera for a minute because I want to talk to everybody that's watching here. So 
listen, I, I, I've owned, I've been blessed. I'm, I'm kind of old at this point in my life. I've owned five businesses. Okay. And I've owned five businesses in different industries. I've owned a mortgage company. I've owned a restaurant that was highly successful, a coaching company and two learning platforms in the mortgage space. And if there's one thing that I know for sure team that is critical is that all successful businesses know their numbers. Now, the successful loan originators that I know, and I'm very blessed to know a lot of them because I coach some of the best loan originators in the country, they're freaks about understanding their numbers. Now, why are they putting so much emphasis on understanding the numbers? Because the numbers guide you in making the proper business decisions as a loan originator. They reveal flaws within your existing business plan. And they also guide you and lead you to areas where you can have massive improvement. And it doesn't matter if you're the owner and CEO of a Fortune 500 company, uh, a small bank, a restaurant, all successful businesses run their businesses based upon the revealing of the numbers that dictate where they need to be focusing their time, effort, and energy. And the reality of it is this, is you only have so much time. Time is super precious. And Time management's a bit of a misnomer. We don't manage time. We manage our choices as to where we spend that time. So what we're going to be going over right now is a business and life planning tool that if you follow and you understand the numbers is going to change your perspective as to where you should be putting and placing your energy associated with the time that you do have. So if we could go ahead and go to the business planning tool right now, I'm going to orientate you to it. So I'm going to look down here. And what I want to make sure you understand is that we have three tabs here. We have the knowing your numbers tab. We have the plan for execution tab. And we have the lead tracker scorecard. We're going to go through all three of them right now over the next 35 minutes or so. Let's start with the knowing your numbers tab. And let me orientate you to it. And the first thing that I want to focus on is this pledge at the top. I owe it to myself, my family, my team, and my legacy to seize the most of my potential every day. The genius is in the execution. Look, we only have one shot at this and we want to do it right. Now, I'm going to get really passionate here. I'm, I'm a coach. I'm super passionate. Um, so if I start going off, pardon me, but I get super excited about these kinds of things. And I'm really passionate about the importance of knowing numbers. So in orientating us to this, we have the assumption section. Anything that is in yellow is for you to change and fill in. OK, you can change these numbers, but you cannot change the numbers that are in white. They are locked down codes. We don't want you to mess with the um, with the coding in the spreadsheet. It'll screw up all the formulas. So question number one, average gross income per loan. If you don't know this number, you need to know this number. Go back historically over the last 12 to 24 months. How many loans did you do? How much gross revenues did you bring in? That will give you your total. Now, I'm going to build an avatar for you here, okay? So roll with me on this. This avatar averages $4,000 per loan. Okay, the next question is the desired annual income from origination over the next 20 uh, over the next 12 months. How much money do you want to make over the next 12 months? Pick a number. You can put in any number in here if it's a million dollars, $300,000, whatever it is. This avatar wants to make a half a million dollars in the next 12 months originating loans. Next question, important question. Number of hours I desire to work per week. Now let's define this. By hours working per week, I'm talking about the hours that you spend on the weekends checking your email. I'm talking about what you do after you put your kids to bed. If you're you know, building out your marketing strategy, whatever it is, let's get real with these numbers because the more real the numbers, the more accurate they are, the more revealing they will be. This avatar wants to have a balanced life. They want to work 40 hours a week and they want to have some boundaries so they can have time with their family. So we've put in 40 hours. Now, next question. Number of weeks annually I desire to take vacation. Let's define vacation here for a minute. I'm not talking about when you're on your phone checking your email at the pool at the resort that you're at while your kids are swimming. I'm talking about how many weeks do you want to take off, off the grid, fully present, spending time with yourself, spending time with your loved ones. This avatar wants to have a balanced life. You may think, wow, six weeks is a lot. As an originator, I very historically and consistently spent eight weeks off the grid a year. You can do it. Trust me. It's about building a great team of people around you and having systems, which we'll get into in a little bit. So this avatar wants to work, uh, take six weeks off for vacation, which means that they want to work 46 weeks out of the year. And what this calculates is a very important number here, the desired hourly rate of pay. Let's go off screen for a minute. I want to, uh, off the, the spreadsheet for a minute. I want to speak to everybody here. 
you're paid by the hour. You've always been paid by the hour. The difference in this business as an originator is that you get to choose how much you make per hour based upon where you choose to spend those hours. I used to do this process every single year for the entirety of my career as an originator, and it was incredibly valuable. So in this particular avatar's case, we've defined that this avatar wants to make $271 an hour. So the question is this, in the activities that you're doing on a daily basis, would you pay someone $271 an hour to do those activities? If the answer is no, I wouldn't pay someone $271 an hour to chase down that recertification of value from the appraiser or to follow up on that condition from the underwriting uh, approval. Then the question is then why are you doing it? Because by you choosing to engage in activities that are less than the desired hourly rate of pay that you're shooting for, you're subsequently lowering your hourly rate of pay. And with all of my clients, once I teach them this and we start to get super real with where they're spending their time, it starts to get, get re reveal very important information. So I know that a lot of you, listen, I'm, I'm not ignorant to what's gone on in the last 18 to 24 months. I know that a lot of your resources have been taken away. I know that you've had to let people go and it's been super painful. But if you want to get to the hourly rate of pay of $271 an hour or whatever the number is, you need to become vigilant as to what you say yes to and what you say no to. So I want to introduce a phrase. What are your hell yeses and your hell noes? Okay, so this is why determining how much you want to make per hour is important. And the things that you're doing on a daily basis that you would not pay someone $271 an hour to do are the exact things that you need to be shedding from your job description and having somebody else on your team handle those activities. The more that you can get rid of those low payoff activities and focus on the high payoff activities, now you're going to see your income skyrocket and your production skyrocket. So what is your job description? It's simple, gang. It's not a complicated formula. Your job description is to talk to people who need to borrow money and people who can refer you to people that need to borrow money. And the more that you do that, the sky's the limit. I got up to about $1,100 an hour by doing this exercise over the course of my career as a loan originator. I have clients who make five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars an hour because they have decided that they're going to take a stand, they're going to build a team of people around them, and they're going to focus on only the money making activities that move the needle for them. Let's go back to the spreadsheet. All right, step one How many loans do I need to do to cover my expenses? Super important number here. This avatar has expenses, both business and personal, to run their life, their mortgage, their car payments, their credit card debt, their, their business expenses of $20,000 a month. You plug in the number, it's in yellow, whatever that number is. If you don't know the number, it's really important for you to know the number. Let's go back off of uh, off the spreadsheet here and have me on camera here for a moment, please. I want to tell you a quick story. So I was coaching this lady named Amy. This is seven or eight years ago now, more like maybe 10 years ago. Great originator, 20 to 25 units a month, every single month. Business starts to really slow down. She starts freaking out. She gets on a coaching session with me and she's like, I'm going to have to let my processor go and, and use contract processing or share a processor. I'm going to have to let my transaction coordinator go. I'm like, whoa, 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 let's pump the brakes here. How many loans are you doing right now? She said, I'm doing like 12. I'm like, I'm like half of what I was doing. I said, well, what's your monthly expenses? Like how much does it cost for you to run your business and live your life? Before we start jumping off buildings and making emotional decisions, let's evaluate what the true numbers are. So I gave her the assignment to get a bookkeeper, come back to me in about four weeks. Let's run the numbers. How much does it cost for you to run your business and your, live your life? And let's come to a conclusion as to how many loans you actually need to do to be okay. The number was nine. She needed to do nine loans a month to be able to be okay. I said, you're, you're fine. I mean, you're actually still banking money at the end of the day. So maybe we shouldn't be making an abrupt decision that would then put us in a situation where when the business turns around, you don't have the resources necessary to, to facilitate it. So let's go back down to the spreadsheet, please. 
All right. So $20,000 a month is how much it costs to run your business and your life. Super important number to know. Now watch what happens. And this avatar lives in the state of California where I live. So it has the highest tax bracket of anybody. So I put 45% in there. I know it's nauseating. If you live in Florida, God bless you. I'm happy for you or in Texas or in Arizona or one of the states that has low state income taxes, 45% for this avatar. Now, what does that tell us? This avatar needs to make $36,364 a month gross to cover these expenses or $436,364 a year to cover their expenses or the important number, 9.09 .09 loans a month. Okay, now we're starting to get somewhere. I need nine deals. I need nine fundings on average every single month to cover my expenses and hit my income goals. So now we go to step two. Where's the business going to come from? And this is, we're, we're at 50,000 feet team. Now we're going to go to about 25,000 feet. We're going to drop down to the runway here on tab two, but let's go a little bit lower in our elevation and let's start looking at the numbers from that perspective. All right. So client database, we're going to start there. All right. So let, let's go off the spreadsheet here for a minute and have me on camera. I want to speak to everybody and, 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 and share with you. There are two things right now you have to have a plan for. If you don't have a plan for these two things, you're not working on the right things. Number one, what is your plan for having a deep connection with your database? And I'm going to get into database management in, in, in a few minutes here and some of the essences of it that are important. And then the second thing is how many approved loans do you have right now of borrowers who have not yet found property? Now, I've been asking this question of a lot of my coaching clients over the last several weeks. And I'm getting numbers like 150, 175, 250 people that I have approved in the last 12, 18, 24, 36 months that have not bought yet. Team, you did the work. You won the deal. They said yes to you. Your team got them approved. And guess what? It's a zero sum game. They're either going to go with you because they feel an obligation to, or they're not because they feel no obligation to. So what's your plan for cementing that relationship and creating the obligation? I want them to feel like they're cheating on me if they don't go with me. So I asked a client the other day, last Wednesday, I was coaching a client. He had 150. I said, how much do you make per deal? Roughly four grand. $600,000 is sitting there waiting for you. What's your plan to make sure you get it? How much, what percentage of those people do you want to get? He said, I don't know, 50%. I said, 50? Well, why 50? Why, why not 90? Why not 95? Why not 100%? Is there any more important plan for you to structure right now than the plan of staying in intimate contact with all those people that you've already done the work for to make sure that it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. When they buy, they feel an obligation to go with you because you have developed a rapport and consistently added value to them on a go forward basis. And most originators will tell me, I don't know what to say. How many times can I call them up, Tim, and say, hey, you know, um, just wondering if you're out there looking for property, wondering if you have any more questions. You don't need to make it that complicated. Here's the thing. Your past client database and those pre-approved leads are just human beings. You don't need to do anything other than connect and become their friend. If you're taking notes, write this down. The loan officer with the most friends wins. It's a simple formula. This job is about building friendships. People don't cheat on their friends, but they do cheat on people who have blown them off. So if you've pre-approved their loan, you haven't talked to them in 12 months, guess what? When they go out to look for property, the thought's going to pop into their head. I haven't heard from Tim in like 12 months. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm open to, to talking to another lender. It's a very different conversation they're having in their head if I've contacted them on a consistent basis, added value to them, checked in with them, asked them how their family's doing, asked them if there's any other areas of, of finance that I can provide them with, with services to referring them to a CPA, referring them to a financial planner. If I truly take seriously the importance of building relationships, I will secure that income. Let's go back to the spreadsheet, please. Okay, so this avatar has 500 clients in their database. Now, I want to define that for a quick second. A client is somebody that you've done a loan for or you have a relationship with. It. We're not talking about, I talk to loan officers all the time that have been in the business for six years and they tell me they have 3,000 people in their database. Well, I know they don't have 3,000 relationships. 
This is not a quantity game. It's a quality game. Who are the people in there that are likely to borrow money that you can serve? And what is your game plan for staying in touch with them? So this avatar has 500. Okay, next important question. On average, you can change this number. On average, my clients do a new loan once every how many years? I think I've picked a very, very conservative number here. Once every five years. Now I realize over the last two years, nobody's refied that has a current rate of two and seven eighths or three and a quarter or whatever. But if you take a bigger body of work, say the last 10 years, those people have done several loans. So I think I've picked a conservative number here. You can change this to three. You can change it, you know, move it back to five, make it six, whatever you want. But they're going to do a loan in some frequency. If rates drop, you know, significantly over the next 12 months, they're probably going to do two loans. So this highlights and sheds some really interesting light. 500 people for this avatar doing a loan once every five years. The closing ratio on eligible loans for my past clients, I picked 50%. I think this is a kind of middle of the road number. I think many people, this number would be 10% or 15% of their past clients are going to come back and do a loan with them because they didn't do a great job for them or they haven't stayed in touch with them. Okay. But if you're staying in touch with your past clients and you have a system of customer service, a perfect loan process, when you facilitate a loan at the end of that transaction, they're like, wow, you guys did a fantastic job for me. Thank you so much. And they're out there as an advocate and an ambassador for you. They're your outside sales force. Every loan that you do is an opportunity to create an ambassador. And this is why it's incredibly important for you to have a process that provides proactive, dynamic customer service. So back to the spreadsheet, I picked a number of 50%. Now, what does this tell me? This tells me that the current available annual, on average, transactions from my past client database is 50 or 4.17 deals a month. It's a pretty big number. If you're making $4,000 a deal, that's $16,000 a month. I think that everybody would agree that's meaningful money and that's why it's important to have a plan. Okay, now next, the percentage of my clients likely to give me at least one referral per year. I picked 10% here in this avatar's case. This avatar is staying in good close contact with their clients. They've done a great job and they've done their loan for them and serving them. They were proactive. They provided them with great education and they have a lot of advocates out there. So 10% of my clients are gonna give me one deal on a monthly basis. Okay, so that's how many? That's 50 referrals from my class past client database a year or 4.17 referrals on a monthly basis. These are not pie in the sky numbers. My numbers were better than that. And I know a lot of originators who have numbers better than this because they stay in touch with their database. So then we have to ask the question of those referrals, those 4.17 a month that I get from my past client database, how many of those people are going to go with me? So I picked a percentage here of 35%. What does this tell me? It tells me that I got about 1.46 deals on a monthly basis that are available to me in my database or 17 and a half a year with a grand total of my database value of being 67 and a half deals a year or 5.63 a month. Okay, let's go back off of uh, the spreadsheet here and go on the camera. Okay. I know that the reason that many of you have not called your past client database over the last year and a half is because you think there's nothing to talk to them about. I want to take all the heat off of you. I want to remove all the pressure. If you go into it with the intention and goal of getting a deal, I could see why you wouldn't call them right now. But that's not the goal. What if you just change the goal? What if the goal is I call three past clients a day to say hello, to connect? to ask them how they're doing, to ask them how their family is, to ask them how the home that they're in is suiting them now. Rate for me on a scale of one to 10, 10 being best, your existing feelings about your home. They give you an eight or a seven, a seven. What would make it a 10? Oh, I'd love to have a swimming pool in my backyard. My kids are getting to the age when they, they'd like to have pool parties, or I wish I had a home, a little bit more room so I had a home office, or I wish I backed to open space because my wife loves hiking, or I wish I was in a different school district. They're going to tell you what would make it a 10 if it's not a 10. You reflect back to them those experiences, and then you have a conversation with them about what it would take for them to be motivated to move to find that home that is a 10. So what I heard you say, John, is that, you know, you really want a swimming pool and you'd like to have a home office. Now, right now we have you at a mortgage payment of X 
And one of the things that I'm finding, I'm going to introduce a term to you guys right now that's really important. One of the things that I'm finding is really important in my, in my job of helping my clients manage their home financing is that we need to identify a strike rate. Now, let me explain to you what a strike rate is, John. What a strike rate is, is it's the interest rate that needs to be available for it to make sense for you to exchange this current loan that you have for a new loan. And that could be as a result of you moving to a new home. It could be as a result of you consolidating the credit card debt that you have of $27,000 that's currently at 31% and the car payment you have. It could be for you to be able to take cash out to put that ADU in your, on your property or build that swimming pool that you're talking about. So let me run some numbers for you and let's play with numbers. Let's look at it at six and a half, at six, at five and a half. But let's determine where the rate needs to be right now in order for there to be something better for you and your family available. Now, here's the thing. You've all been there before. Rates come tumbling down. They come down faster than we even expect. And you're scrambling. Shit, I bet I got a lot of deals in there. And you start looking through your database. You don't have it organized. You have to start calling these people and leaving messages. And then they get back to you. And then they want to see the numbers. And you don't have enough free time in the day. You got to get out there and hire another processor because there's opportunities that are being lost because you weren't ready. Okay. But wouldn't it be better if you knew that now? When you have the time now, wouldn't it be better to know the strike rate? because you had those conversations with those people right now. So you could have days like I had back when I was an originator. I wake up in the morning, I turn on CNBC, you know, Rick Santelli from the Chicago Board of Trade comes on, bonds are, 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 are rallying. I'm going, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get in the office and look at my rates. Okay, and I knew I've got 11 people at five and three quarters. I've got another 13 people at five and a half. I've got 12 more at five and three eighths. Now, what does this do for me? This does a couple of very important things. Number one is it allows me to staff up in advance of the demand. When I start seeing it get to around six and I know I've got 11 deals at five and three quarters, I can go hire that contract processor or bring another one aboard and share it with another originator in my company. But I can also fast track me being able to lock these loans. Because if you think that I picked up the phone and called those people and said, hey, John, it's Tim Brahim at First Rate Financial. We talked, you know, six months ago, and I'm wondering if you'd like to talk about, hey, I had some great news, five and three quarters now available. Would you like to talk about it? I'm not going to have, that's not going to be the message. The message is going to be simple. Hey, John, Tim Brahim, First Rate Financial, got great news for you. You remember the rate that we established as your strike rate? It's available. I locked you in. My team has gotten you reapproved. We're going to be sending you an email with documents we need you to upload to our portal. The next payment that you make is going to be the last payment, that $270 a month higher than you should be paying. And the payment that is available to you on May the 1st will be $270 lower. I'm so happy we're able to do this for you. If you have any questions for my team, let me know. Click call the next person. And I would just dial for dollars because they were already stacked up and ready because the conversation and agreement took place months before. And that's what you need to be doing right now with your database. And again, in closing, take the pressure off. You're not calling them to try to get a deal right now. You're calling them to let them know that you care. You're calling them to connect with them. And you're calling them to establish what it would take for them to list that home and sell and move to another area or to consolidate and refinance the debt that they currently have. Please, let's go back to the spreadsheet. Let's talk about referral partners. All right. So the number of referral partners and the number of referrals per strategic partner. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just picking a conservative number here. I get a deal a month from my referral partners, my realtors, accountants, financial planners, insurance agents, divorce attorneys, human resource directors. And by the way, people say to me all the time, which one should I focus on? Which one's the best? They're all great if you're great at it. You need to be laser focused on a niche that you can dominate. You need to be better at it than anybody else. So if you're gonna go after divorce attorneys, know that niche. If you're gonna go after CPAs, know how to talk that talk. Okay, so one deal per strategic referral partner or 12 deals a year. The number of strategic referral partners I have is 10 in this avatar's case. Please take me uh, back to the camera if you would. All right, so my best year I did 676 loans. 64% of those loans came from my past client database. There are people in your past client database that are tremendous referrers. You just don't know them. 
There are people that you never even talked to when you did their loan, the spouse who didn't take the lead that is the networker. There are people in your database that are human resource directors, that are owners of small businesses, that are hairdressers, that have five people a day in their chair for 45 minutes and they're talking to them and they're an extrovert. Your job is to make friends with those people and for them to be thinking of you whenever they know somebody who has a need. So the other 36% of my business came from referral partners. Now I talked to way too many loan originators who have way too many referral partners. I talked to a client of mine 10 years ago now, his name is Shane. He was in my backyard at one of my retreats. I said, bro, how many referral partners do you have? He said, I have you know, about 48 real estate agents. I said, the math isn't making sense to me. You're doing 10 deals a month. And I said, I know some of those deals are coming from your past client database because you did some refis this year. So of those 48 realtors that send business to you, how many of them are actually loyal to you? How many of them actually send you business? And as we broke down the math, I mean, he was counting people that hadn't sent him a deal in 14 months. He was counting people that send him one deal a year. That's not my definition of a referral partner. When things really shifted for me is when I realized that this is not a quantity game, it's a quality game. All of it's a quality game. How many times you touch base with your past client database is a quality game, not a quantity game. The notion that you need to touch base with your past client database 30 to 40 times a year is ridiculous. You're white noise at that point, 30 to 40 times a year. I touch base with my past client database eight to 10 times a year, but it was with impact strategically. And the same thing with referral partners. And when I scaled it down at my peak, 676 loans, I had four top producing real estate agents, I had three real estate agents who gave me a deal once every three to six months, but I liked them. They were fun to work with, good people. I had two CPAs that were good for between 15 and 25 deals a year, really deep relationships. I had a life insurance agent who was terrific. He was good for 20 deals a year because we strategized on how he could introduce my services in the equation of his presentation to help pay that life insurance premium. Okay. And I had a, a, two local bankers who would give me all their construction permits. That was it. I had about 10 referral partners, maybe, maybe 12 to 13 total. But the quality of the relationship is the key thing here, team. Let's go back to the spreadsheet, please. Okay. So this avatar, number of strategic referral partners, they have 10, which means they're getting 10 leads a month, 120 leads a year. Conversion ratio. What percentage of those leads are you converting? I picked 25% here. I picked that for an intentional teaching point. I'm gonna to get to that in a second. So that's two and a half deals from my referral partners or 30 deals a year. Guess what? It's a lot less than what I'm getting from my database if I'm managing it correctly. We spend so much time pursuing referral partners and so little time pursuing our database with a plan. And that's something that I think that you should be evaluating or at least what these numbers are showing in this hypothetical scenario. Let's look at this number here, this 25% number. And if you'd please take me back to camera, I wanna, teach here again. When you run your numbers, you start to see some patterns. Wow. Um, this referral partner gives me X amount of deals uh, a year, but my batting average with them is 10%. But this referral partner, my batting average is 50%. What's the difference? Might it be in the way that they're referring you? And have you ever sat down with them? and taught them how you'd like to be referred. It could also be where they're getting their business from, but not all referral part partners are created equal. I realized this with my CPA, Richard Blythe, who was good for 25 deals a year consistently. And, and I bet you my batting average, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was over 80% easily with him. Because they'd call me up and they'd say, Richard said that I should use you, what do I need to do to get started? No talk of rate, no talk of fees, nothing like that. Because of the way he referred me. So here's a script for you. You sit down with your referral partners and you tell them the truth. I was on a, a call with somebody teaching and he posed a question about, you know, how we refer each other. And I, I realized something. I've never asked you to teach me how to refer you. I've never asked you to teach me how to endorse an ambassador you. You're kind enough to refer people to me. And it's my job when I take that initial call to say things about you as a real estate agent or a CPA or a financial planner that you could never say about yourself without sounding arrogant. What is your value proposition that you want me to speak to them to really cement the relationship? Because I've had this happen far too many times and it's really uncomfortable for me. Client gets referred to me. I do a great job of serving them. 
they end up going and buying a home and they buy with a different realtor. And then I'm in a really uncomfortable position because I'm kind of caught in the middle. I feel like somehow I'm not being loyal, but I didn't actually do anything wrong. And I realized I actually did do something wrong. I never asked you to teach me what it is that you want me to say about you to really cement the relationship on your behalf. I guarantee you, no realtor will ever be turned off by this conversation. They will <laughs> always be flattered. They will always be grateful. And by the way, a lot of times they won't even know what their value proposition is. And that's an opportunity for you to talk it through with them and help uncover it, to help them with their scripting, to improve their batting average. But when that conversation's done, you now have earned the right to say the following. John, if you wouldn't mind, can we just reverse the roles here for a second? Can I share with you some of the things that I'd like you to say about me before you introduce a client to me, just to make sure that we're kind of working in tandem here and really helping each other. They have an obligation at that point to listen to what you have to say. And this is how I would teach my referral partners how to sell me. And when you do that, your batting average goes up a lot because people come into the conversation with an understanding of your value. And the focus is no longer on rate and fees. It's more on the value that you bring as an advisor. Let's go back to the spreadsheet, please. All right, consumer direct. We'll cruise through this real quick. This is obviously a lot lower batting average game. I used to do a ton of consumer direct. Maybe you're buying Zillow long form leads or doing some um, social media marketing strategies with pay-per-click and all that kind of stuff. We just picked here that the number of leads generated from a consumer direct campaign is 10. You can change that number. Batting average is 6%. This is kind of highlighting here. Well, like, wow, I'm spending a lot of time, effort, and energy here, and I'm only getting 0.6 deals a month. Something's got to give. I either need to get my batting average up or I need to get more leads per spend. But in this hypothetical scenario, we're looking at eight deals a month, or excuse me, eight, deal, eight um, uh, loans generated on a... Uh, excuse me, we're looking at a total of six loans generated on a uh, on a monthly basis and 7.2 a year. And this gives us our grand total, 104 and 8.73. And if you remember the number from up top of 9.09, we're running a little bit short here. Okay, so now we're going to get uh, a little bit further down the path. So we got 8.73 deals that we're getting from the numbers that we plugged in up here. $4,000 average check, $418,000 a year in income, not quite enough, leaves us uh, a little bit short, but there's another number here to fill in, which is the gross non-mortgage additional income pre-tax. You know, do you have a spouse that works? And if so, what is his or her compensation? Do you have rental property that kicks off income or dividend income associated with investments? We want to plug that number in. I put in 100 grand, and that gets us to the bottom line here. 436 grand is what you need to break even. 500,000 is the goal. 518 is the target that you're at. And you are in the money to the tune of about $82,000. Now, if you're coming up short, then you got to go up here and start playing with these numbers and saying, okay, what do I need to do to move the needle? I got to get my batting average up here. I need to get my batting average up here. Maybe I need to add a couple of referral partners, et cetera. So now let's go down to the runway. What's the plan for execution? So this is where you're going to track your activities and you're going to and you're going to hold yourself accountable. So the first thing that I want to show you is that you change the date here. So today's the seventh. So three slash seven. And when I do that, it goes all the way out for a full year every day for the next 12 months. Okay. So I've given you some sample actionable activities for these different buckets. You could add, delete, do whatever you want with it. I just wanted to give you a bit of a roadmap of the things that I think you should be doing right now. Let's take a look at a few of them. So call five people a day in my database to connect. When you do it, you check the box, okay? So you can kind of keep track here and it'll total it up for you as to how many days you executed on that plan there, okay? Um, send out a monthly newsletter. This stuff still works, team. I have a couple of great loan originators, Jay Dacey being one of them who sends out a newsletter every month. And you know most of his business comes from his past client database because he stays in close connection with them. Film a video and send out HomeBot monthly. Um, by the way, I want to speak to HomeBot. HomeBot's a great tool, but one of my great fears about HomeBot is I think a lot of originators kind of hide behind that. They think, well, if I set out HomeBot every month, that is my database management strategy. I think it's a part of your database management strategy, but I don't think that there's a lot of intimacy of connection or loyalty built from it. It's a branding tool. And I think you got to go deeper. Send out a weekly market update video or educational email. 
um, Michael Regan. If you haven't seen my podcast or listened to my podcast, I recommend it. I interview a lot of great originators. Michael Regan was a January 1st podcast. And, um, you know, what he does every single Monday is he consolidates Barry Habib's MBS Highway Report from Friday. And he does about a three to five minute video and he sends it out to his entire database, updating them on the market. Super easy to execute. He, you get comfortable with it after a while and you get really good at it. Consumer Direct, I've given you a bunch of scenarios here. Create three reels for Instagram Weekly. So, uh, I've got clients who have 75, 80, 85,000 followers on Instagram. When rates drop, they're going to make a lot of money. Um, but you need to be highly invested in your Consumer Direct. It's not a dabble in it thing. You got to be really committed to, to being an expert in that area. Send out 5,000 direct mail pieces for HELOC debt consolidation monthly. Send out $500 worth of YouTube pay-per-click ads monthly. That's another thing Michael Regan is doing very successfully. He's getting two or three deals a month from YouTube pay-per-click with about a $500 a month spend. Um, he talks about that on my episode if you want to listen to it. Realtors, here's your game plan for realtors. Um, financial advisors and CPAs. Here's some next actions with them. And then miscellaneous. And I highlighted this one because it's the easiest one to implement. You could take me back on camera here for a moment. I developed this plan, I don't know, maybe my fifth year in the business and did it every year for the remainder of my career. I just call it two a day, 10 a week, 520 a year. My, my personal assistant, Fern, was responsible for putting two blank note cards on my desk every morning. And John, before we got on the call, we were talking about Italy and I used to live in Italy. And, and so I'd get these cards on Amazon that are called Florentine note cards from the city of Florence. There's a very beautiful flower print note card. And my job was when I got put on hold or when I had a free moment was to write two handwritten notes every single day. It didn't matter who it was to. It could be my mom. It could be a past client, it could be a realtor, it could be, you know, a CPA, it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was the consistency. Two a day, 10 a week, 520 a year. Now, there's some rules to this. Do not put your business card in the card. You don't need to sign your last name. We're going for friends here. Hey, Kathy, I'll give you an example. I had a real estate agent, Kathy McLean, her son, only child, Christopher, went to Azusa Pacific College. I knew that he was going away to college and about a month or so after he left, I grabbed the card and wrote a card, handwritten note card to her. Hi, Kathy. It's Tim. Just wanted to say hi. I know Chris went away to school. I'm sure that it's probably a little bit challenging for you right now. I want you to know that I'm thinking about you. If you feel like getting together for a cup of coffee, let me know. Sincerely, Tim. That's it. No business card. No embossed logo on the envelope. No, 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 no. The minute you do that, their guard goes up. It's a sales call now. I'm not looking for people's guards to go up. I'm looking for them to go down. I'm looking to connect with them and transcend the relationship from Tim Brahim, who's a loan officer, to Tim Brahim, who's my friend who happens to be a loan officer. Two a day, 500, uh, 10 a week, 520 a year. I promise you that will get you a lot of business over the course of your career. Let's go to the final tab, please. Okay, now, batting average. I'm passionate about this. Scripting is the name of the game. The words that come out of your mouth have everything to do with your success. So I, I used to have this yellow legal pad on my desk, just like this, okay? And I started looking at the numbers. We can go back on the camera here for a second. Sorry about that, Paula. Um, and there was this lender, Ditech Funding, that I was losing. John's laughing. There's this lender. I tend funding. And what I, what I decided to start doing is that every time I got a lead, I'd write down the name of the person. And then I'd have another column that said, you know, yes or no, did they go with me or not? And then the source of the lead. And then if they didn't go with me, why? So do you ask the person why they didn't go with you if they didn't? Because that's the information you want to know. That's where you're swinging and missing. You know, it's just really simple. Hey, John, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to display the value that I bring to you. And, and it's disappointing to me that you've chosen to work with someone else, but I understand. And I want to apologize for having not done the job that I should have done. Do you mind me asking what made you choose this other lender that you're going with, this credit union, this bank, whatever? They're going to give you the info. Rates, your rate was too high or your fees were too high or I feel like I learned more from them or whatever the case may be. Well, guess what? Ditech funding kept showing up. And I'm not talking about once or twice. I'm talking about four or five times a month. And John knows why. Because they were advertising way better rates than I could give. 
They were on CNBC and they were on a bunch of billboards here in Southern California. So I started looking at that. I'm like five deals. I mean, I make $4,000 a deal. I'm losing $20,000 a month to these guys. So I picked up the phone and I called them and I started asking a lot of intelligent questions, playing consumer. And what I realized is they were quoting 10 day mandatory delivery. I'm quoting 45 day best efforts pricing. No way I could compete, but this is a refi. And in that refi, there's at least one weekend, sometimes two, and there's a three-day right of rescission. So to quote a 10-day mandatory delivery is to actually quote a rate that you can't physically lock today and close on time. So once I found that out, I started arming the consumer in my scripting. I'd bring up Ditec in my presentation before they would even bring them up. And I'd say, if you talk to them, here's what I want you to ask them. And time again, everybody would come back to me and say, you're right. They, they couldn't lock me in. That's why they're rated so low. I'd say, well, you have to ask yourself the question, would you want to start off the relationship with a lender that was actually being deceptive in their marketing strategies? And I stopped losing deals to Ditech and it made me thousands of extra dollars. So let's go back, please, to the spreadsheet and we'll wrap this up. Here's what I want you to do. I simply want you, this goes down for a full year. I simply want you to go down and every time somebody calls you up and you have a new lead, I want you to put their name in who they were referred to you by, whether they went with you or not, and if they didn't go with you, why they didn't go with you. It will calculate over here your batting average so you can see how you're doing and you're gonna start to see patterns. Huh, interesting. Whenever this real estate agent refers somebody, I mean, they referred five people to me in the last two months and I didn't get any of them. Well, because they're giving out two other business cards along with mine. But when this real estate agent refers somebody to me, I almost close all of them. And it will start to give you the data that you need to be able to start to make very intelligent business decisions. Okay, let's take me off of camera here if we, if we can, please. Or onto camera, I should say. So in closing, um, I want you to use this spreadsheet. I'm going to give you the URL here in a few minutes. Go download it. Play with the numbers. See what they reveal and what they tell you. And start to build out a plan for next actions of things that you can be doing to be more successful going forward. Now, John mentioned in the intro that I created this thing a long time ago called LoanToolbox.com, which was the standard for education in the mortgage space back in the 2000s. We had up to 10,800 loan originators that were learning predominantly from me at the time. And about a year and three months ago, I've been asked time and again from people like, man, the industry hasn't been the same since Loan Toolbox went away. Um, I sold that company in 2006. Um, and people kept asking me to do it again. Um, and I didn't want to until I realized that I needed to. And I needed to do it with this incredible group of teachers that I'm blessed to call my clients and friends. So we created something that launched on January the 8th that I want to show you a very quick video on, and then I'm gonna give you a quick demo of the website. Originators, we face a mountain of challenges. Climbing to the top 50 loan originators in the United States for eight consecutive years wasn't easy. It took focus, and it took mastering some specific business strategies that got me there. The Loan Atlas is a clear roadmap that will guide you to success. With our structured curriculum, you will learn to master the eight essential business and personal disciplines of loan origination mastery. But it's more than just about learning. It's about connecting with a community of like-minded business professionals and growing together, backed by the finest and most giving faculty that the industry has ever assembled. People like Josh Metal, Ryan Grant, Craig Strent, Tyler Osby, and many more ready to share their knowledge and expertise with you. Are you ready to take the first step to the peak in your profession? Join us at The Loan Atlas. Your journey to excellence begins here. <clears throat> so before I show my, I'm going to take you into The Loan Atlas here in a second. <clears throat> then we'll wrap and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, the Loan Atlas is, as Ryan Grant puts it, the MBA of the mortgage industry that it, it never has had. Um, there are over um, 60 hours of educational videos contained within the website, but it's much, much more than that. It's a entire community platform. Um, we're not just giving you YouTube videos here. This is professionally produced content that is from 17 different faculty members, all of which are top producers. 
that are here to teach you how to find success, especially in today's market. So if we can, please, I want to take them into the website. If you could switch over to my screen. Thank you. So <clears throat> this is the homepage and there's a scrolling banner ad here that is the live events that we do every month. This is a virtual coaching platform. So the last Friday of every month, I coach live for 75 minutes on a forum called Talk to Tim. You write in your questions, you jump on the Zoom line, I answer them for you and coach you. So that's once a month. Every month we have a masterclass. The masterclass in January was taught by Mark Bowie who has 78,000 followers on Instagram. He taught a masterclass on social media marketing. Masterclass in uh, February is taught by Tyler Osby, how to host realtor events, both on Zoom and live. That is his wheelhouse. The masterclass in April will be taught by Josh Metal on how to handle the situation with the NAR lawsuit and real estate agent commissions changing. Um, whoops, what did I just do there? Sorry about that. The <clears throat> masterclass in the month of March will be taught by Josh Burris and Caleb LeGrand, two guys that know more about how to get builder business than anybody I know. Um, that is the core of their business. Now, every masterclass two weeks later to the day has a implementation call. So you take the masterclass, then you show up two weeks later with the teachers and you learn from them on the implementation strategies of what they taught. So three live calls a month. Talk to Tim, masterclass, masterclass, implementation call. Starting in April, we have office hours. What are office hours? Think of it as a university. When you're taking a history class at a major university and you want to ask the professor questions, they have office hours. You get to go to their office, sit down and hang out with them. Every week starting in April, a faculty member will host office hours where you just zoom in. They'll be there for an hour and they're there to answer your questions. But it's way more than that. <clears throat> so if we look here at the platform itself, we have learning paths, which is one way to access the content. So in this particular case, this is an example of a learning path called the Rainmaker. You take an assessment of where you wanna focus on your business. This path, the learning path of the Rainmaker is all about marketing and how to generate leads. And as you can see, each one of these thumbnails are educational videos. Now I wanna show you another way to orientate yourself to the site. And I wanna give you a, a quick little glimpse at a couple of the videos. So um, let's go to the fifth discipline of origination mastery, which is systems of customer service. And let's go to this teaching module, which is the perfect loan process review part two, which is taught by me as the instructor. <clears throat> so every single teaching module below it has a wealth of resources. So we have the summary of what is taught in this class. We have the transcript time coded out of exactly what was taught. We have the learning documents, which includes the written scripts that are taught within this particular training. And this is an actual script from, uh, from one teammate to the next. This is about customer service. We have the learning document, which is where you take your notes, you log your key insights, your next actions, and a summary, and then followed by key points that are extracted. And then we have support documents. So in this case, this support document is the actual perfect loan process itself, a 72 step process to proactively provide dynamic customer service on every single loan to generate repeat for repeat customer business and referrals and give you the ability to cross sell the real estate agents on every transaction, the CPAs and the financial planners, along with all of the scripts. This is just one, one example that I'm giving you here. Okay. So if we go back here, the last thing is, is that you complete the lesson by taking an assessment. So we have a quiz for every training module. There are over 200 training modules within the Atlas and growing. And this will help you ensure comprehension. It's a seven question quiz that you go through and you answer multiple choice. So let's take a look back to the, um, the teaching, just to give you a sample. Step 20, review checklist. 
much more in the way of efficiency and in the way of customer service if they're receiving a clean handoff from the transaction coordinator. And this is why you need somebody who's thorough in that capacity and understands what an underwriter might be looking for. Okay, moving to the next step, step 20. Review checklist of do's and don'ts with the borrower as part of the application process to verify days that the borrower may not be in town during the loan process, new purchases that should not be made, taxes being paid at certain times of the year, etc. I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, make a list of the things. So it just gives you a quick example of how the content is laid out dynamically with really high production quality. And this is walking you through and your team through step by step how to significantly enhance your customer service. In a market when things are slow, like right now, every deal is more important. Every deal is an opportunity to get another deal. Every deal is an opportunity to make sure that client comes back. You cannot afford to not do a great job for somebody right now on every single loan you do. That has everything to do with your future success. I'm going to give you one other example just so you can see another teaching. Um, let's go to discipline. Let's go to discipline number uh, two. And we'll go to Ryan Grant's teaching on... Um, I don't want my credit pulled. This this is this discipline has 48 different teachings on what you need to say. All the objections you need to counter, all the scripts that would be used by me, Ryan Grant, Tyler Osby, Josh Metal, Josh Burris, Craig Strent. I mean, our faculty is brilliant in scripting. Um, so let's see here. Where was that one of Ryan Grant's? I don't want my credit pulled. Let's just take a quick look at that. I remember vividly, it was a Saturday morning and I get a phone call out of the blue from a prospective client that says, hey, I was referred to you and I want to write an offer on a property, so I need a pre-approval letter. I just don't want you to run my credit. And at the time, I did not know how to handle that. So I fumbled a little bit, tried to tell him why it was important that I ran a credit because I didn't want a pre-approval letter out in the marketplace with my name and brand on it if I wasn't certain about it. Long story short, I ended up losing that client because I just didn't handle that question appropriately. Good news is that now not only do we know how to handle it, but we're going to give you the script and the strategy to ensure that doesn't happen to you. So let's say a client calls you and says, hey, okay, for the sake of brevity, I won't <clears throat> play any more of the video. Um, let me just also show you that we have <clears throat> A, a very vibrant community communicating with each other and helping each other in our message board forums. And there's a lot more to come. Um, let's go ahead if we can, please, and just go to the last slide. Thank you. Okay. And then I want to open it up for questions and answers and teach you because that's what I'm really here to do. So if you want to know more about the loan Atlas, scan this QR code. It's going to take you to a landing page. And on that landing page, is a ton of information about the loan atlas, videos that you can watch, samples, et cetera. It's normally $349 a month. When you look at that in the context of coaching, usually coaching is somewhere between $15,000 and $18,000 a year, and you get one coach who may or may not have experience in the mortgage business. This is 17 different coaches teaching you all month long, coaching you all month long, and it's for a fraction of the price. It's normally $349 a month for a one-year commitment, we're knocking off 29% for Flagstar and lowering the price to $249 a month. Again, the summary, you have three live coaching calls each month, direct access to the faculty with the office hours, uh, timely business tips that are sent out. We're building out an entire marketing library, scripts and presentation tools, and a vibrant community helping each other. Um, on that URL, um, and I think it's covered up by the little banner, uh, yeah, right there. Perfect. Thank you. No, that, that's actually great. Can you please put that back up there? And then can we please post that in the chat for everyone? So you want to go to either the QR code or the loanatlas.com forward slash flag start. Mm -hmm. Scroll down about halfway and you'll see that the business planning tool that I went over with you is there. 
and you can just download that for free. And that's on that same landing page. And please do that because I want you to use it and I want you to be able to benefit from, from the evaluation that we just did today in looking at the numbers. John, I know I did all the talking. I'm going to take a breath. I apologize. And um, I'm, I would love to hear anything you have to say and any questions you have and happy to answer anybody's questions. No, uh, hey, uh, these things, that's my job, right? To understand the flow and not and not stop the flow. That was tremendous. Um couple questions came in that you answered already throughout the presentation. Um, obviously, gang, again, uh, you know, one, thanks to Tim for doing this. Two, incredible uh, what's on the slide right now in regards to what he's willing to do for you uh, being part of this event today um, and what he's offering and the content that you just saw. And that just, honestly, guys, that scratches the surface of what – For sure. Know, Tim just is scratching the surface of showing you with regards to the loan atlas and everything that you will have at your disposal. Um, it's interesting. I did write a couple of things down as we were going through this. Um, but I'll ask you this question, right? Cause a couple of questions did come in about, you know, the tool, right? The spreadsheet that we were going over yep. and then obviously with the different tabs, the plan and then the tracking and all that stuff. A couple of people asked the question just in regards to like when you actually, for the first time, like maybe they don't have a business plan to that length of detail, right? Like what you're asking them to commit to, because they should, right? There's no doubt about that. You're going to have potentially, they were talking about like those aha moments you were kind of touching on, right? Which is like, how much time am I really spending on this that relates to X? Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions came up, like in, in your history, have you seen it where LOs have looked at that and said, you know what, I, I'm not going to, do anything with this. I'm going to have more, more of my time is going to go into this area because look at the rate of return that I'm getting versus I'm going to try to dabble in all these things because they could all lead to a loan. So just, I guess some thoughts around that because it came oh, up goodness. in that way, all different versions. Such a great question. And, and I, I'm thrilled you asked it. So I have a few responses. So the first time I did my numbers, <clears throat> I referenced that CPA, Richard Blythe, who to this day is still my CPA. He's been my CPA for 25 years. At the time, he was just a referral partner. <clears throat> and I got him, by the way, during the perfect loan process, during the execution of the perfect loan process, one of the steps is to send the final closing statement to the CPA along with a really nice written, you know, written letter saying, you, I, I'm sure that you're going to need this for your tax planning purposes. And I hope that you find this to be helpful. And by the way, please find and close the customer survey from our mutual client, you know, Jane Doe. And you can see that she really was, was appreciative of our services. He picked up the phone and he called me and he said, I've never had any lender do this. I'd like to get together with you for lunch. And that was it. That's all it took. Just, just that one step. Um, when I started to first run my numbers, John, I realized this, this particular year, I believe I had closed 23 loans with him and I went to lunch with him once and I had realtors that I'd gone to lunch with six, seven times and was marketing to and all that. And I got like four loans from, I'm like, wait a minute, like I'm putting all this time, effort and energy and I'm not getting the yield. Like, and I'm not putting in, what if I put more time into Richard? Like what would happen then? So that was one really big aha moment for me. And then to answer your other question, yes, this happens a lot where somebody will do the numbers and they'll start to realize, wait a minute, like I'm putting a lot of time into this consumer. I've, I've had this happen as an example with social media marketing. So let me speak to social media marketing. This is a, of all of the things that I could think of the one that I most passionately would use as an example of if you're going to do it, be great at it or don't do it at all. It's not a like one toe in the water type thing. None of this stuff is like if you're going to pursue divorce attorneys, be the best person in your community at pursuing divorce attorneys. Understand the psychology of it. Understand what they're looking for, what's important to them, how to market to them. Understand where you're going to get introductions from. Like if you're going to pursue them... The answer is yes, it will work if you're great at it. But loan originators that dabble in seven or eight different things that are chasing a bunch of shiny objects, they're not good at anything and they don't get the yield. So in the case of social media marketing, 
the originators that are getting business from it now are the ones who have been devoted to it for about 12 to 18 months. They have their day of the week where they write their scripts for their reels. They have their day of the week where they do their shooting and editing, and they're consistent with it. They're not, you know, 12 feet away from the camera with a poorly lit backdrop and don't have a message that's compelling. Like they get that this is a science and they've tweaked and adjusted it. So I implore you, no matter what it is that you're choosing to focus on, be a master at it. It will work if you're a master at it. I can guarantee you that, but you got to commit to it and be fully devoted to that niche. A couple of questions came in around Again, related to the um, to the work spreadsheet, the worksheet, right, and everything sure. we were talking about for kind of that first forty five minutes of the session. I guess I would phrase it this way, Tim. A couple of them came in. More of a definition, if you're doing the worksheet, like what's your definition of a referral partner, right? Because you talk about it, right? It could be a real estate agent, it could be a CPA, but like if I'm actually being honest with myself, mm -hmm. what's the definition of a referral partner to you? Because, like you said, like I could get one referral a year or two from this real estate agent, but are they really a referral partner? Like if you're filling out that form and you want to be honest and you're trying to get down to the brass tacks, mm -hmm. what, what, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't have a hard set number. I kind of actually base it less on numbers and more on what's the experience that I have with this person? Because as I said, I, I used to, there's a community an hour from where I used to work called Ojai, California. And I used to, I used to have, I had a, you know, bunch of realtors up there who I really loved. Like, I mean, they, they were just nice people to work with. Whenever we would do a deal together, it was graceful and fun. And they're, I loved playing golf with them and, and having dinner with them or whatever. And they weren't big hitters, but they were a joy to work with. And I'd get about four closed deals a year from them. And, and it was, they were easy loans because they referred me the right way. That's a relationship. I had a relationship with them. I also had real estate agents who would give me three deals a year as an example. And it was like giving birth, like it was really painful. Okay. And, 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 and there wasn't any loyalty and they give out three business cards. And the next thing, you know, I find out that they've actually been doing other deals with other lenders and they're kind of shopping around and people would call me up and say, you know, so-and-so gave me your card and wants, you know, what, what's your rate? And I can't get them to refer me a certain way. So I would, I would make it less about the number of deals and more about the depth and quality of the connection and respect between you and that person. So I, I, I if somebody is giving you two deals a year, I, 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 I think you could still count them as a referral partner if you've been working with them for a while, but then you need to ask yourself the question, why am I not getting more now? Is it because they just don't have enough leads? Cause that could be the case. Or is it, for some other reason, because they're not really loyal to me or they're not very good at what they do and I can help them with their scripting to get more people to me. I mean, the reality of it is, is this, John, in, in the last 24 months, especially, and you know this, you know this probably better than I do. A loan originator that has some skill is worth a lot to a realtor right now, a whole lot. And that skill is being able to have a conversation with the client about the value of buying a home and their overall financial strategy and the likelihood of appreciation and how this interest rate right now at six and three quarters percent is a short term landing spot for you. We're going to refi you. I'm going to manage your debt for you on a go forward basis and make you aware of opportunities to swap this money for cheaper money. Here's what it's going to cost you by staying on the sidelines. If you look at the course of the next five years and the likelihood of appreciation, here's what's going to happen when rates drop values are going to go back up. We still have an inventory crisis. A good originator is somebody who can be a true partner to a real estate agent right now. So it could be back to that one, you know, one or two deals a year that you're just not a great partner to them. They may be getting a lot of leads, but they can't get them to you because they're not very good in their scripting. So you have to get under the hood and evaluate it, but don't put people in there that you don't get business from. That's my point. So if you have 50 realtors that you're pursuing and only nine of them have ever given you a deal before in your history as an originator, then you have nine real estate agents, not 50. You have nine real estate agents and 41 prospects. And the question is, how do I go deeper with those nine? Maybe I need to liberate a few of those nine and let them go work with somebody else and replace them with an upgrade, which is a process that I went through. You know, I realized a long time ago, John, 
it's actually funny because when I first started the business, I was just like probably most everybody on this call, where I, I felt like, you know, I can't go after the top producer because I'm, I'm new, you know, I'm not very good. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you're selling you. And if you don't believe in you, you're going to have a tough time selling yourself. And then there came this point where I realized, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. I'm pursuing real estate agents who do a deal every six months. So they don't even actually have that many deals to give to me. Like, why not just go after the big hitters and maybe, you know, when their lenders on vacation or overwhelmed or they drop the ball, I'm going to get my opportunity. So I ended up upgrading for lack of a better term to, you know, those four top agents that I, that I referenced. But earlier in my career, I had, you know, 15 agents that gave me, you know, two deals a year. And that's 15 relationships I have to try to manage. It's much easier to go deep and manage four really powerful relationships with people who actually have a lot of business to give to me. Yeah, it's interesting because you kind of drilled down to where I was going to ask a follow up question, which was using your example, right? 50 relationships, nine were actually referring business to you. The 41 other 41 other ones are prospects. And you mentioned something at the very beginning, which I wrote down because it just struck me of when I started in this industry a long time ago. It's about managing choices, not time management, right? And yeah. in that example, you just said it, right? Like maybe I was choosing to spend time with two or three of those nine that aren't resulting in what it should be. So you liberated them. And now I'm going to choose to focus more of my effort on the 41 prospects because with inside that, there might be somebody that turned into your top four that you dealt with, right? So it's about Correct. choices of where you're putting your resources. Correct. And and if we're going to talk time management for a quick second, because that's one of my favorite topics, I have, I don't know, eight hours of time management content in the Atlas as an example. I mean, I, I, I'm passionate about the topic. Um, I mentioned earlier that time management is task management and choice management. Um, you don't manage time, you manage the choices of where you, you what you do with your time. And it's about getting clear on your hell yeses and your hell noes. But it's deeper than that. It's getting really clear on why you say yes to a hell no. Like, why why do I say yes to that when it doesn't move the needle for me or it's not something that's really a high payoff activity? And the answer is a four-letter word that starts with F. And I'm not going to go off color here with you, although I am capable. The word is fear. Okay? We oftentimes say yes to something we shouldn't be saying yes to out of fear. Fear of disappointing someone. Fear that if I if I don't pursue those 50, of which nine are only real, somehow my business is going to drop because I don't have enough irons in the fire. But that's just a story. And you don't have to believe everything that you think. Okay? Just because you have that thought doesn't mean it's true. You know, the 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 question is. What can I do to get those nine to give me more business and then maybe add another two big hitters rather than going, you know, scratching the surface with many going deeper with few? Nah, Tim, man. So, so I took like three pages of notes while you were talking, right? And Thank you. it's just so funny because I remember like when I first started the industry, I was a retail loan officer before I went into being an account executive. And I remember training in a much different aspect when I first started with this company. I was straight out of college. I spent 30 days in operations, right? Sitting next to an underwriter, processing loans, closing loans. I went out in the field with an appraiser for 30 days. Like I got assigned to it. So you learned all aspects of the business, right? And then it started building into this whole, like breaking it down into dollars per hour, right? And it's just, man, it's refreshing. Like a couple of things you talked about, like, hey, why, why were customers saying no? Ditech. Now I start researching why am I losing loans at Ditech? I think to me, those are some of the powerful, I mean, so much today, but like the, the asking a client why they went with somebody else, right? The asking why I'm losing the business. Why didn't they choose me when I got brought to the table and doing that? Like, it's not really a hard question. I think it becomes a hard question because people don't want to hear the answer. That's right. That's right. That's, that's, you nailed it, bro. And here's another example of that. I'm working with a prospective client and the client chooses to go somewhere else. What I used to do is go to the top left-hand corner of my CRM and hit, you know, drop down, delete and curse their name, you know, because I'm frustrated because I didn't get the deal. That's a bad business move. 
the script is really simple. John, I'm so sorry that I didn't do a better job of displaying to you the value that I bring to the to this relationship. And and I want to apologize to you for for failing in that attempt. Um, you know, as I shared with you in our previous conversations, John, my job really just begins when your first loan closes with me, because from there it's my job to assist you in managing the largest indebtedness you'll ever take on in your life. And um, what I would like to offer to you is this. I'm going to check in with you in a couple of weeks, see how things are going on your loan with this with this other lender. I want to confirm the interest rate that you got locked in at. And then I'd like to offer my services for free going forward and to continue to manage your debt for you on a go forward basis. And when there are opportunities to swap that debt for cheaper money, I'm going to be proactive in making you aware of that opportunity. That's called adopting the loan. I lost the loan, but I'm going to get the next loan. Now, here's what would happen. Sometimes they'd call me back in four days because their new lender of choice is not returning their calls or they're asking them for documentation or they didn't actually lock them in and they're quoting them a higher rate. I even had this happen a bunch of times. I'd get a, a phone call nine months later and they'd say I was referred to, you know, by John Gibson. I'd be like, John Gibson, like I'd go into my database. Oh, I never got, John ended up going with that other lender, but John ended up referring me to his friend, even though he didn't go with me. Now, why does this happen psychologically? Well, guess what? At least 50% of all people that do a loan are unhappy with it when they close. So why not leave the door open for them to second guess, did I make the wrong choice here? And then come back to you. But see, these little simple things, bro, I mean, this is what makes the difference. And we're talking about little subtle nuances in your scripting and your approach that have everything to do with your success long-term. Yeah, for sure. Well, hey, Tim. I kind of touches on a lot uh, after the fact from some questions and some things that were out there. Um, hey, brother, I can't say thank you enough for doing this. This oh, was tremendous. You. Um, really appreciate you carving out some time to share just tremendous insight um, for all of you know a lot of our value partners that are going to see this, whether they see it live or they see it in the recording when we send it out. Um, I can't say thank you enough for doing this, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Very much my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I love to teach. And so when I'm given an opportunity to teach, it's just, I'm grateful for it. So thank you. Awesome, brother. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye, everyone. All right, gang. Hey, appreciate it again. Um, you joining us. Uh, wow. Just a wealth of information there. Um, and, and obviously, uh, take Tim up on his offer uh, uh, with the Loan Atlas. Great deal that he was running. Just a tremendous uh, insight. You get the spreadsheet today, right? Um, challenge yourself, right? For some of you, that's going to be a lot different than how you've looked at doing that. You've honestly taken a look at your business before. That's going to be something you probably haven't done. And, and if you have, you haven't done it in a while, right? Um, so challenge yourself. And then look, great resource in Tim. Uh, can't speak highly enough about him. So uh, next month on the 11th at 2, we have uh, Daniel Hayes from Greenline. Uh, he's going to be joining us and he is in the world of kind of streamlining, making efficiencies in regards to, you know, think about the non-QM space, bank statements, that whole processing of those loans, how the income gets calculated, how it gets obtained, uh, where the documentation is coming from, how you can streamline that whole process, make that more efficient, not only for you, but for your borrower to give an experience unlike any other in that space and then ultimately help you win uh, and create long lasting relationships with that book of business. So really excited about Daniel coming on board uh, for our session in April. And again, as we say, always can't say thank you enough uh, for joining us today. Again, whether it was live or you see this in recording, we certainly appreciate the partnership with you. We understand you, know, you have choices and we value our relationship with you. We'll keep working, keep putting on things like this for you. So uh, have a great rest of your day and hopefully uh, your first quarter closes out extremely strong and you start second quarter uh, with a bang as we get into the you know traditional purchase season. So uh, see you again in April for our flex series with Daniel Hayes from Greenland. Take care.